today's topic is spatial nerve paralysis and lesions which cause this spatial nerve paralysis. Today we will discuss the anatomical aspects of which you know the various routes it takes to come out of the skull into the temporal bone and into the face. Then we will discuss various lesions affecting the patient you now causing paralysis and we will also discuss the various management modalities which are available to us. Now facial nerve is actually very unique because it supplies the motor nerve of the face. So nobody can hide the facial nerve paralysis because it is very much evident on the face for everybody to see. So it is actually a dreaded uh, nerve as far as ontologists and parotid surgeons are concerned because they can inadvertently cause damage to the facial nerve leading on to facial paralysis in other words paralysis of the facial musculature and mind you every nerve which is in affected has got a ability to regenerate facial nerve is so complex that this regeneration process may not be perfect 100 percent of the time so what could happen if the regeneration process goes haywire, it can cause abnormal connectivity. So what can happen if the facial nerve regeneration process creates abnormal connectivity? For example, you all know the terminology crocodile tears. What exactly it means? The crocodile, when it sees a prey, it starts to tear. Why tears occur in crocodile's eye? Because the salivary gland of the crocodile as well as its lacrimal gland are supplied by the same nerves. So when the salivary gland is stimulated, automatically the lacrimal gland also stimulate, gets stimulated and leads on to lacrimation. So uh, everybody thought that crocodile is shedding tears for its victim. So that is the reason why the term crocodile tears was used. The same thing can happen when facial nerve regeneration is imperfect or it goes wrong. So what can happen is whenever the patient is having appetite or when the patient is having salivation or the patient, patient is having food in front of them, the patient starts to lacrimate in addition to salivation. So this is known as crocodile tears. So the patient starts to shed tears as soon at the site of food. Next probable complication is known as synkinesia. What exactly do you mean by synkinesia? Abnormal contraction of unwanted muscles. Abnormal contraction of unwanted muscles. For example, when the patient attempts to blink the eye, the angle of the mouth also tends to act. The angle of the mouth also gets deviated. So whenever the patient attempts to blink the eye, the angle of the mouth also deviates. So what? This is again one of the problems of faulty facial nerve regurgitation. Mind you, if a surgeon creates a facial nerve paralysis, this is going to lead to medical legal negligent cases. And it goes without saying, the most common cranial nerve lesion happens to be the facial nerve lesion. And the, last but not the least, the degree of paralysis has got a bearing on the retroid. If the paralysis to begin with is very severe, the chances of recovery is poor. But this does not hold good for idiopathic facial paralysis. As in the case of Bell's palsy. In Bell's palsy, the paralysis can be very severe to start with, but this severity has got has got no bearing on the reproductive ability or the regaining of the function of the musculature of the face. So in patients with Bell's palsy, even though they have a severe degree of paralysis involved in the patient musculature, they have excellent prognosis. They have a chance of 90, more than 90 percent chance of regaining the facial muscle function. And the idiopathic uh, Bell's palsy, the idiopathic uh, facial nerve palsy is also known as Bell's palsy. You can make a diagnosis of Bell's palsy 
only after ruling out all the other cases of patient muscular paralysis all the other known causes of patient muscular paralysis mind you acute arthritis media can lead to facial paralysis this occurs commonly in patients who have a decussent facial nerve or a facial nerve which does not have a fallopian canal so the nerve is exposed to the bacteria as well as the purulent material inside the medial cavity so acute arthritis media can cause facial nerve paralysis and the degree of paralysis again has got a bearing on the completeness of the record and chronic separative arthritis media can cause facial nerve paralysis because of the erosion of the fallopian canal caused by granulation tissue or cholecystoma and the role of electrophysiological examination in these patients is very important because it helps us to have an idea of the prognosis of the lesion we can tell the patient whether what the chances of recovery are it also serves as a indication for more aggressive therapy whether the patient needs active surgical intervention or not so that question can be answered only after doing this electrophysiological test and facial palsy in acute arthritis media are commonly seen in children i have been telling you the facial palsy in acute arthritis media is commonly seen in children and then i have already stressed again commonly occurs in children the excitation now and then it is very common it was initially common in the pre antibiotic era where these infections were not treated aggressively with antibiotics prognosis is fairly good and pathophysiology how exactly acute arthritis media causes facial paralysis acute arthritis media always causes a alteration in the middle ear environment the alterations can be elevation of the middle ear pressure there can be osteotic reaction acute inflammation wherein the patient of physiology could be directly affected acute inflammatory process can affect the physiology of the patient now retrograde infection within the facial canal what happens is when small when a small segment of the patient nerve is exposed due to degesens infection can permeate that area and it can spread retrogradely and can affect up to the cardiac ascend via even the cardiac nerve and can affect the entire facial nerve i repeat again retrograde infection within the facial nerve can can occur even a small degesens is sufficient to ensure spread of bacterial infection or spread of viral infection takes place within the facial nerve even the cardiac tympanic nerve which is a little bit exposed inside the middle cavity can be involved in acute arthritis media infection and this cardiac tympanic nerve infections can travel via the cardiac tympanic nerve to involve the facial nerve even though the facial nerve canal may be intact still facial paralysis can occur in acute separative arthritis media because the cardiac tympanic branch of the facial nerve is exposed to the environment exposed to the middle ear environment and separation or collection of pus infection in the middle ear cavity can spread retrogradually to the cardiac tympanic nerve to involve the entire facial nerve and then there is a neurovascular communication between the middle ear and the facial nerve so infection from the middle ear can spread via the vascularity as well as nerves exposed nerves and to reach the facial nerve cause facial nerve paralysis infection causing compression of vessel supply in the facial nerve again infection i have already told you there is elevation of middle ear pressure this elevation of middle ear pressure can cause compression of the blood vessel supply in the facial nerve causing localized ischemia and subsequent infarction so the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve is more vulnerable to vascular insults than any other portion of the facial nerve that we will see later no chronic arthritis media can cause erosion of the fallopian canal the formation of granulation tissue the fallopian canal per se can be eroded by paracetamol and mind you it is not as good prognosis is not as good as in aom in chronic arthritis media the prognosis is rather poor and these patients may not recover 100% if treatment is not 
initiated properly. Now let us go to the surgical anatomy of the facial arm. This is very very important because unless and until we know the exact anatomy of the facial arm, we may not be in a position to identify the location of the insert. We may not be able to identify the various uh, problems uh, which lead to facial nerve paralysis. And the uniqueness of the anatomical uniqueness of the facial nerve, the course of the facial nerve is very complex. And the only cranial nerve which winds around the abducens abdu nucleus. So this nerve, cranial nerve, winds around the another cranial nerve nucleus in the pontomedullary uh, junction in the fourth ventricle. Inside the fourth ventricle, you can see the patient now winding around the abducens nucleus. So, in all central lesions of the patient now, there is a bright chance of abducens nerve also being involved. And this facial nerve is very complex for the simple reason. It carries sensory fibers, it carries motor fibers, it carries pro, uh, pro, uh, parasympathetic fibers. So it is known to carry sensory fibers, it is known to carry motor fibers, it is known to carry parasympathetic secretor motor fibers. The parasympathetic secretor motor fibers are known to supply the lacrimal gland and the parotid gland. Secret of motor fibers, which arise from the superior salivary nucleus, is known to supply the lacrimal gland and the parotid gland. The total number of myelinated axons, this is actually myelinated axons, more, and more seen in motor nerves. The total number of myelinated axons in the seventh nerve is around 7000 to 9000, and it is confined to the motor root of the patient nerve. And one myelinated axons are seen in the parasympathetic secretor motor fibers that they are about 3000 to 5000 in number and they are seen in the nervous intermediate portion of the patient nervous intermediate portion of the patient now let us go to the various components of the patient now. the patient now contains special visceral these branchial efferent motor action they supply the muscles derived from the second arch so Patient now has special visceral supply, branchial efferent motor axons which supply the muscles derived from the second arch. The muscles derived from the facial nerve which supplies the self, muscles which are supplied by the seventh nerve in tone, these are all derived from the second arch, muscles of facial expression, buccinata, stapedius, platysma, vestibular digestic, stylophyre. The special visceral efferent motor actions of the patient now are joined by Gentle visceral efferent. The special visceral efferent motor actions of the patient now are joined by general visceral efferent. These are nothing but precatalonic parasympathetic axons from the neurons in the superior salivatory nucleus, which will ultimately synapse on the post ganglionic neurons in the pterygoparathen ganglion or the submandibular ganglion. Let me tell you here at this juncture, these special visceral efferent motor actions of the patient nerve as well as the general visceral efferent of the patient nerve don't synapse at the level of the genital ganglion but they synapse at the post ganglionic neuron in the pterygopelton ganglion or in the submandibular ganglion it should be clearly understood then what are all the sensory components of the patient nerve i've already told you patient nerve is a mixture now which contains both motor and sensory components what are all the sensory components of the patient? The special visceral afferent carries sensation of taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue via the coracoidal nerve. The first sensory component happens to be the special visceral afferent, which carry sensation of taste from the anterior two thirds of the tongue via the coracoidal nerve. Then general sensory afferent axons, which carry cutaneous sensation, which it could include pain from the posterior aspect of the external artery canal. I repeat again, gentle sensory upfront axons carry cutaneous sensation including pain from the posterior aspect of the external artery canal. This area, posterior aspect of the external artery canal is also innervated by Arnold's nerve which is a branch of the auditor branch of vagus. So this Arnold's nerve, when it gets stimulated, then you attempt to remove the back from the ear 
or the syringe so what happens is it causes extreme giddiness or it can cause a repeated attack of cough and these are all possibilities of stimulation of the adrenal because vagus is controlling the cough reflex so when the patient starts to cough when you want them to do a removal of wax from the external channel it goes without saying you would have inadvertently stimulated the adrenal channel which is a branch of the vagus nerve and another important aspect is this important site the posterior wall of the external canal is where you see vesicular eruptions in ramsey hunt syndrome which is actually caused by herpes simplex virus the sensory area innervation of this area is also responsible sensory innervation of the posterior wall of the external canal is responsible for production of histelberger sign in acoustic schwannoma what happens is due to involvement of the patient now the posterior wall of the external artery canal loses sensitivity that sensation so there will be hypothesis hypothesia in the posterior canal wall in patients with acoustic schwannoma and this particular sign is known as histelberger sign this histelberger sign is a standing is a proof for the sensory supply general sensory afferent axon supply of the facial nerve supplying the posterior wall of the external artery canal then nervous intermediates of riesberg this contains general visceral afferent axons mediating pain now nervous intermediate uh, intermediates of riesberg i repeat contain general visceral afferent axons that mediate pain from the tongue and vocopharynx this important connection we lacon for the presence of uh, rashes in the soft palate anterior pillar of tonsil and anterior two thirds of tongue in ramsey hunt syndrome so in ramsey hunt syndrome it is actually caused by herpes simplex virus infection here this involves the nervous intermediates of riesberg where the general visceral afferent axons which mediates pain and sensation in the tongue and oral pharynx general visceral afferent is also affected in ramsey hunt syndrome this could lead to rashes in this supply area of supply namely the soft palate anterior pillar of tonsil and anterior two thirds of the tongue so genicular ganglion is involved in ramsey hunt syndrome ramsey hunt syndrome is nothing but the virus affecting herpes simplex virus affecting the genicular ganglion and uh, normally what happens is wherever there is the area supplied by the facial nerve or the nerve from the genicular ganglion can lead to rashes in the area which can involve the soft palate anterior pillar of the tonsil anterior two thirds of the tongue now let us see the motor component the motor axons of the facial nerve they arrange on the neurons in the facial nuclear complex this is actually present in the lateral portion of the central tegment of pons just above the pons medulla transition so this is actually the level of the pons medulla transition this image shows a section being made at the pons medulla transition this is actually the nucleus of the patient now from which the motor fibers originate and these fibers runs posterior medially you follow the cursor this is the obtuse and nerve nucleus and then runs through the pons arching over the obtuse and nerve arches over the obtuse and nerve then turns anterolaterally to exit the brain stem so lesions involving the facial nerve nucleus in this area can also involve the obtuse nerve also and one more curious finding which which has recently surfaced is the motor nucleus of the nerve to step medius does not reside in the seventh nerve nucleus it is not within the seventh nerve nucleus 
it is outside the seventh nucleus. I repeat again, the nerve to stapedius muscle, the nucleus which supplies the nerve to stapedius muscle arises outside the seventh nucleus. So any lesion involving the seventh nucleus could spare the stapedius muscle for the simple reason because the nerve to stapedius is arising from a separate nucleus outside the facial nucleus. Now, what exactly are the central connections of the facial supranuclear connections? The neurons of the face area of the motor cortex, they have bilateral projection. They project to both sides. The facial motor neurons that control the muscles of the upper face, motor neurons of the muscles of the upper face, namely frontalis and orbicularis oculi, they are bilaterally represented in the brain. And mind you, all the other muscles are projected contralaterally to the facial motor neurons. So the middle and lower third uh, muscles of the face are represented contralaterally in the brain. And this really accounts for the sparing of forehead muscles when the paralysis involves the upper motor neuron. In all patients with paralysis of the facial or upper motor neuron type, there is sparing of forehead muscles, the forehead muscles and the orbicularis oculi muscles, frontalis and orbicularis oculi muscles, they are not paralyzed in upper motor neuron type of lesion because it receives bilateral innervation from the cerebral cortex. Now the nerve to stapedius, I have already told you, the nerve to stapedius is known to arise from the neurons that lie outside the main, uh, main facial nucleus. So, stepedial reflex can be found intact in lesions affecting the facial nucleus. It need not be lost as previously thought. Now, let us see how facial nerve serves to proprioception. So, craniofacial muscles innervated by the facial nerve, they don't have muscle spindles. I repeat again, the facial muscles innervated by the facial nerve, they don't have the muscle spindles. The presence of muscle spindles is very important for transmission of proprioceptive impulses from the muscles. The proprioceptive impulses tells the brain the state of the muscle contraction, whether it is relaxed, how much it is contracted, and these details are fed to the brain as a, by a feedback mechanism by this proprioception. Since these muscle spindles are lacking in the muscle, uh, facial muscles, they, you need an alternate mechanism whereby proprioceptive sensation from these muscles would reach the brain. So what has happened is there are certain modified cutaneous mechanoceptors or corpuscular, corpuscular like structures within the muscle. These are nothing but cutaneous pressure receptors. These cutaneous pressure receptors have been identified in the facial musculature. So these proprioceptive receptors take over the functions of the muscle spindles which are absent in the facial muscles. Now let us come to cutaneous connections. So the cutaneous connections or sensory innovation because the facial now has both intra and extra cranial connections with the cutaneous branches of all three divisions of the trigeminal now. I repeat again the facial now has intracranial as well as extracranial communication with the cutaneous branches of the fifth cranial nerve and the branches include trigeminal nerve, vestibular and then it also communicates with the vestibular cochlear nerve, it also communicates with the glossopharynx nerve, it also communicates with the vagus nerve and also with the cervical branches including the greater auricular, lesser occipital, transverse cervical nerve. So, this intercom it is interconnected with other sensory nerve also. Facial nerve is interconnected with other cranial nerves, namely trigeminal nerve. All the divisions of the trigeminal nerve are connected to the facial nerve. Branches of the vestibular cochlear nerve are connected to the facial nerve. Then glossopharyngeal nerve branches are connected to the facial nerve. Vagus nerves are connected to the facial nerve. The nerve branches of the cervical plexus, which include the greater auricular nerve. Lesser occipital nerve and transverse cervical nerve also has interconnection, cutaneous connections with the seventh cranial nerve. 
So these two tennis connections are very important because they facilitate tumor spread. Now, just some of the tumors from the parotid, like mucoepidermoid carcinoma, is known to cause perineural spread. So, tumor spread can occur through these interconnections. So, when the parotid tumor can cause focal pore paralysis because of the interconnections with the vagus nerve, interconnection with the vagus nerve. So, this can explain focal pore paralysis seen in parotid malignancies. Intracranial extensions of the tumor mass in parotid malignancy. This is because of the extensive interconnections between the other cranial nerves. This will promote, facilitate perineural spread of tumors from the parotid gland, particularly mucoepidermoid carcinoma, which is deadly in its uh, spread because it is known to spread through the nerves. Perineural spread is common in these types of tumors. And let us come to the various branches of the parotid nerve. The parotid nerve, actually, I have already told you about the various connections with the parotid nerve. This is actually a diagrammatic representation of the intracranial course as well as the extracranial course of the patient. Nerve. And this actually is a facial motor nucleus, and this is the abducens nerve nucleus. I already told you this nerve curves above the abducens nerve nucleus and comes out of the brain at the junction of the pons and medulla, ponto medullary junction. And now, let us dwell a little bit into the nervous intermediary, which is actually, which accompanies the patient. This is actually, it um, conducts general visceral effect, special visceral effect, and general visceral effect axons. And these axons contribute to the nervous intermediate of the iceberg. This nerve actually lies between the motor root of the patient nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve. So, nervous intermediate lies between the motor root of the patient nerve as well as the vestibular cochlear nerve as it comes out of the brain stem. The axons of the motor root of the patient nerve and the nervous intermediates freely intermingle within the pons. I repeat again, the axons of the motor root of the patient nerve and the nervous intermediates intermingle with the substance of the, within the substance of the pons. But they emerge separately. Even though they intermingle within the pons, when they come out at the point of medullary junction, they separate. They come out separately. They emerge separately. And the route of entry or exit zones of the facial nerve and nervous intermediates and the more distal transition zones of these nerves are very important because this is where microvascular decompression can be attempted. So, what happens when the when these nerves, the nervous intermediates of the iceberg and the patient nerve come out of the at the level of the pont or middle junction at this particular junction, the central myelin, the central myelin is actually this central myelin which is found in the central nervous system is produced by the oligodendrocytes. And then when it comes out, these nerves are covered by peripheral myelin. These peripheral myelin are produced by the Schwann cells. So, mind you, the myelin material inside the brain is, all, is known as the central myelin. And the myelin material which is seen outside the brain is known as peripheral myelin. So, when this nerve within the brain, it is covered by the central myelin which is produced by the oligodendrocytes. The moment it comes out of the brain, it is no more lined by peripheral myelin central myelin sorry is no more lined by central myelin but it is covered by peripheral myelin which is produced by the Schwann cells. So, this is where swelling occurs in the nerve and it can cause due to this is occurs due to inflammation in that area and this can lead to hemifacial spasm due to constant irritation. So, microvascular decompression should be attempted in this area to treat hemifacial spasm. And this is actually the diagrammatic illustration of the nervous intermediates of Reisberg. Now, the patient now can be divided according to its course. Now, it can be divided into intracranial or cisternal portion, which is inside the skull, brain, and then intratemporal portion, which lies within the temporal bone and extra temporal portion which is outside the temporal bone. 
So the pores of the patient now can be divided into intracranial or cisternal portion, intratemporal or the portion of the patient now within the temporal bone and then extratemporal. So we will see that these divisions in detail one by one. So this is the cisternal division. Cisternal division is about 24 millimeters long. So this is actually the motor root of the facial nerve and the nervous intermediates can be otherwise known as the sensory root. Courses, I have already told you, anterolaterally, it just winds around the abducens and nucleus and lies anterior to the cisternal segment of the vestibular cochlear nerve. So, patient nerve lies anterior to the vestibular cochlear nerve. 8th nerve, 7th nerve lies anterior and superior to the vestibular cochlear nerve for some distance. These nerves are enriched by a delicate layer of retinoid matter. The absence of connective tissue, there is actually very little amount of connective tissue covering the nerve in this area. So, the absence of connective tissue in this area makes it really vulnerable when you attempt to remove a tumor in this area. So, when you attempt to remove tumors, it's actually, this area is actually known as cerebellopontine angle. So, tumors involving the cerebellar pontine area, area when a pontine angle, when you attempt to remove tumors from cerebellar pontine area, because of the paucity of connective tissue element covering the seventh nerve, it is very difficult to separate the nerve from the tumor. And, and it's also very difficult to identify the nerve during surgery. So, this is a place where patient nerve monitoring is very, very important and patient nerve should be protected at all costs during the surgery. This nerve is vulnerable in this area because of the lack of protective connective tissue covering. Now let us come to the intratemporal. Intratemporal portion actually length varies, varies from 28 to 30 millimeters. It is further subdivided into meatal portion labyrinthine portion, tympanic portion and mastoid portion. The meatal portion actually runs entirely within the internal acoustic meatus. The meatal portion runs entirely within the internal acoustic meatus. The labyrinthine portion runs lateral to the internal acoustic meatus. After coming out of the lateral internal acoustic meatus, it travels laterally to reach the geniculum or the first genome. So, Labyrinthine segment lies lateral to the meatal segment and then comes the tympanic segment. Tympanic segment starts from the first genome, runs backwards towards the second genome. Tympanic segment starts from the first genome of the facial nerve and then runs backwards towards the second genome, which happens to be the beginning of the vertical segment. The vertical segment or mastoid portion runs from the second genome to the silomastoid form. So the first three segments namely meatal, labyrinthine and tympanic segments do not display any fascicular organization. What exactly is fascicular organization? The nerves supplying specific musculature are arranged in identified pockets. So this fascicular organization is not clearly obvious in the first three segments. So injury to the patient now occurring in the meatal labyrinth or tympanic segments, they do not cause discrete paralysis of the various muscles supplied by them. So there is no discrete paralysis of facial muscles supplied by the nerve when lesions involve meatal labyrinth or tympanic segments because it does not show any fascicular organization. And when there is no fascicular organization, again when repair occurs, when the damage of the facial nerve occurs, repair has to be done. And this reparative process cannot be perfect when there is no fascicular organization. Because when there is no fascicular organization, the repair will be chaotic. So this causes synchinesis. So whenever facial nerve damage occurs in the meatal, labyrinthine or tympanic segments, it is more common for the patient to develop synchinesis because the Regeneration process is not very very accurate, very very accurate because it lacks the organization, fascicular organization. These proximal segments, mind you, 
labyrinthine, namely in neater labyrinth and tympanic segments, they are invested by arachnoid matter. These segments, proximal segments are invested by arachnoid matter. They do not have epineural or perineural sheath. So, uh, neater and labyrinthine segments of the patient, uh, they are invested by arachnoid matter, but they do not have epineural or perineural sheath because they do not have this fascicular organization. Fascicular, have, fascicular, have fascicular organization, the epineural and perineural sheath should be present. So, this lack of fascicular organization indicates that these segments, namely the neater and labyrinthine segments, they lack epineural and perineural sheath, but they are just lined by arachnoid matter. So, suturing the nerve in this area is technically very, very difficult. So, if you want to reconstruct the nerve or re-anastomose the nerve damage in that area, you need to use tissue glue. You need to use only tissue glue. You cannot suture the nerve when it is injured in this area. For the simple reason, there is no connective tissue support. Let us go to the neatal segment. The neatal segment is about 5 to 12 millimeters long. The motor root of the facial nerve and nervous intermediates run through the internal acoustic neatus. The internal, internal acoustic neatus has medial and lateral portion. The medial portion is known as the porous and lateral portion is known as the fundus. So, from medial to lateral, the motor root of the facial nerve along with the sensory root namely nervous intermediates runs from the porous to the fundus namely medial to lateral. And this portion of the facial nerve is also accompanied by the cochlear nerve and the superior and inferior vestibular nerve and labyrinthine artery. So this facial nerve along with its sensory component is accompanied by cochlear nerve and the superior and inferior vestibular nerves and the labyrinthine artery. The nerve bundles that make up the sensory component or nervous intermediates join the facial nerve within the internal acoustic nerve. The nerve bundles that comprise the nervous intermediates, they join the facial nerve at the inter internal acoustic nerve, just about 3 millimeters from the from its medial end. The components of the vestibular cochlear nerve, in fact, are known to rotate 90 degrees, 90 degrees when they travel from the brain stem to the inner ear. The facial nerve remains anterior. The facial nerve remains anterior in its course, anterior to the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then within the internal aortic canal, it lies anterior to the superior vestibular nerve. And in the lateral end of the meatus also, it lies anterior to the superior vestibular nerve. Now, at the level of the lateral portion of the internal aortic meatus, this is actually the location of the facial nerve. So, this is the anterior wall of the internal, uh, lateral portion of the internal artery matter. This is the posterior wall. This is divided by a horizontal crest known as fallopian crest. And then there is a vertical bar known as a Bill's bar. It divides the superior portion of the fundus into two. Anterior portion of the superior portion is occupied by the facial nerve. And the posterior portion of the superior portion of the internal artery meatus is occupied by the superior vestibular nerve and then the inferior anterior portion is occupied by the cochlear nerve and the inferior posterior portion is occupied by the inferior vestibular nerve. So this is actually exactly how the nerves are organized at the lateral end of the internal artery meatus. I, I repeat the internal artery meatus lateral end is divided by a horizontal bony crest known as falciform crest. And then there is a vertical crest from the root and this vertical crest divides the superior portion of the uh, lateral wall, lateral portion of the internal artery matters into two. The anterior portion of the superior portion is occupied by the facial nerve and the posterior portion is occupied by the superior vestibular nerve. And the inferior portion of the internal artery matters, anterior portion is lined with it, is occupied by the cochlear nerve, posterior portion is occupied by the inferior vestibular nerve. Now let us view the applied aspects of the lateral portion of the 
internal reactants. The, the close anatomic relationship between the motor root of the patient, nervous intermediates, and vestibular cochlear nerve. Here in this area, could very well explain the disturbances caused in lacrimation, taste, salivary flow, hearing balance, facial motor control, loss in patients with CT angle lesion. The CT angle lesions or internal acoustic area lesions, the involvement of motor root of patient, the involvement of the sensory root of patient, namely the nervous intermediates, the vestibular cochlear nerve, can lead to lacrimal gland disturbance, lacrimation disturbances, taste disturbances, salivary flow disturbances, hearing disturbances, balance, imbalance, or lack of facial motor control, all these symptoms which are commonly seen in CT angle lesions can be accounted for. Well, let us go to the labyrinthine segment. This is actually a diagrammatic representation of the labyrinthine segment of the patient. It starts from the first genome, extends up to the second genome. Mind you, the labyrinthine segment starts from the first genome and extends to the second genome. It is about 3 to 5 millimeters long. It is the shortest part of the facial nerve. This is the shortest segment of the facial nerve and also the narrowest segment of the facial. It is about 6, 0 0.68 millimeters. And this is only segment of the nerve that lacks the anastomotic blood supply to this area. Here there is no vascular cascade anastomosis. So what happens is this area is highly vulnerable to insert. So first genome, starting from the first genome up to the second genome, this forms the labyrinthine segment is highly vulnerable. This is highly vulnerable because of its narrow distance and then because of the lack of arterial cascade. So commonly involved in edema following inflammation. So at the distal end of the labyrinthine segment, the geniculate ganglion forms a sharp hairpin band that is a first genome. Here this is the geniculate ganglion, this forms a first genome. This is the labyrinthine segment, shortest portion. This is the, you watch my cuts, sir. this is the labyrinthine segment. The commonest uh, area, the commonest area where the facial nerve is involved, around 43% of facial nerve paralysis occur in this area, involves a labyrinthine segment because this happens to be the narrowest and this is also the shortest. It lacks the uh, arterial uh, anastomotic arcades supplying the blood vessel. And mind you, here there is a hairpin bend that is the first gen, this is the geniculate ganglion. So the patient nerve from the labyrinthine segment makes a hairpin bend here. The extension is from the internal acoustic meniotus to the first genome is the labyrinthine segment. The distal end of the labyrinthine segment, namely the first genome, is also known as the geniculate ganglion. So at the genome, this nerve at the level of the genome, it is cradled by the superior semicircular canal. See, you see, this is the superior semicircular canal. Posteriorly, at the level of the first genome, the relationship at the level of the first genome includes superior semicircular canal. Posteriorly, anteriorly, inferiorly, you have the cochlea. Anteriorly, inferiorly, you have the cochlea. So now, this portion of the nerve could be accompanied by the subarachnoid space. So this portion of the nerve can be accompanied by the subarachnoid space. This subarachnoid space can extend up to the level of the geniculate ganglia. Now let us see what exactly is the role of the gen geniculate ganglia. Geniculate ganglion is a sensory ganglion. I repeat again, geniculate ganglion is a sensory ganglion. But mind you, it does not contain synapses. It does not contain synapses. The central processes of general somatic afferent neurons in the ganglion carry pain from the external optic canal and terminate somatically in the spinal tract of trigeminal nerve. The central process of general somatic afferent neurons inside the ganglion, they carry pain from the external artery canal and they terminate in the spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve. The central process of special visceral afferent, the somatic visceral afferent neurons in the genicular ganglion carry taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So the central process of the somatic visceral afferent neurons, they carry 
teeth sensation of the anterior two third of the tongue via the carotid pine nerve and terminate at the second or neuron level of the gustatory nucleus. The gustatory nucleus is present at the rostral end of tractus solitaris. The gustatory nucleus is present at the rostral end of the tractus solitaris. The carotid pine nerve is thought to modulate the trigeminal and glossopharyngeal sensitivity. The carotid pine nerve is also known to modulate the trigeminal and glossopharyngeal sensitivity. The preganglionic parasympathetic axons which travel in the patient now to the lacrimal gland as well as the peritic gland they should synapse at the trigoparotid ganglion or the submandibular ganglion so this preganglionic parasympathetic axon should synapse at the either at the trigoparotid ganglion or at the submandibular ganglion but they pass through the genicular ganglion but they don't synapse there i have already told you the uh, genicular ganglion does not contain any synapse so the preganglionic parasympathetic axons destined to synapse at the postganglionic neuron in either the pterygoparotene or submandibular ganglion pass through the genicular ganglion and they pass without synapse. Now I am restarting the entire lecture right now. Because of the power outage, I need to stop. Let us start from the labyrinthine segment. While I was explaining the labyrinthine segment, I erroneously pointed out the tympanic portion as the labyrinthine segment. Let me tell you, the length of the labyrinthine segment is about 3 to 5 millimeters. It happens to be the shortest of the facial nerve segments, and it is also the narrowest portion of the facial nerve segment. It starts from the internal medial and lateral end of the internal acoustic nerve and lasts up to the first year this is actually the portion of the labyrinthine segment not this this is the labyrinthine segment and this is the shortest and the narrowest portion it also lacks the anastomotic arcadial arterial cascade it does not have anastomotic arcadial cascades so thereby it is vulnerable in its blood supply so this area of the patient now namely from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerves up to the first genome is the most vulnerable portion of the patient nerve. And this accounts for nearly 43% of the patient nerve paralysis. It is more vascular insults are commonly seen in this area. This is involved due to edema of the patient nerve. And moreover, the nerve does not have any space to expand because it is the narrowest portion of the patient nerve. So here the distal end of the labyrinthine segment that is here there is a hairpin bed that is a pulp gel and that is actually the pulp gel of the patient now formed by the genicular ganglion so here this first gel is created behind by the superior semicircle and anteriorly by the cochlea and inferiorly also by the cochlea so i repeat again the labyrinthine segment of the patient now starts from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerves and extends up to the first gel I stand corrected. I had pointed erroneously this portion as the labyrinthine portion. It is actually this portion, this short portion starting from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerves up to the first genome. This genicular ganglia or the first genome is cradled by the superior semicircular canal posteriorly and cochlea anteriorly and inferiorly. And this portion of the nerve can be accompanied by subarachnoid space up to the level of the genicular ganglion. Up to the level of the genicular ganglion, the subarachnoid space from the brain can accompany. That is due to the genicular ganglion. The genicular ganglion, I have already told you, the sensory ganglion, it does not contain any synapses. That is very important. It does not contain synapses. The central processes of general sensory neurons in the ganglion they carry pain and sensations in the external articular they terminate somatically in the spinal tract of the trigeminal so general sensory of the neurons travels in the genital ganglion carrying pain from the external articular and they terminate in the spinal tract of trigeminal in central process of somatic visceral affront they carry taste fibers from the anterior two-third of the tongue via the carotid tendon and they also mount to somatically 
somatotopically the stop at the second order neuron in the gustatory nucleus. The gustatory nucleus happens to be at the rostral end of the tractus solitaris. The parotid membrane nerve is thought to modulate actually the trigeminal and plasopendral nerve sensitivity. The preganglionic parasympathetic axons, they are destined to synapse at the postganglionic neurons either in the pterygopeltine fossa or in the submandibular nerve. So these nerves, preganglionic parasympathetic axons, traverse through the basal nerve and they don't synapse at the genicular ganglia but they synapse at the level of the pterygopeltine ganglia and the submandibular ganglia. These fibers carry secretor motor fibers to the lacrimal gland and the salivary glands. Let us go to the applied anatomy of the genicular ganglia. The genicular ganglia actually lies in a fossa which is covered by very thin layer of bone. So this thin layer of bone separates the genicular ganglia from the middle cranial fossa. Daily sensors are common in this area. So daily sense actually what happens is it can make this area of ganglion vulnerable in middle cranial fossa surgery. So whenever you are attempting to do a middle cranial, middle cranial fossa surgery, daily sense in this area can lead to risk of damaging the genicular ganglion. So enlarged genicular ganglion fossa when seen in CT actually it should strengthen the diagnosis of genicular ganglion fossa fracture in patients with traumatic facial palsy. So in patients with traumatic facial palsy if you do a CT and you see the uh, genicular ganglion fossa slightly enlarged, it really strengthens the diagnosis that there is a damage to this ganglion due to trauma. And during translabyrinth surgeries, the labyrinth uh, portion of the patient you know, is at risk. That too when you are drilling up along the semicircle, superior semicircle canal because the genicular ganglia lies perilously close to anterior to the superior semicircle canal. So the genicular ganglia lies anterior to the superior semicircle canal. So during translabyrinthine surgery, the labyrinthine surgery, uh, segment is at risk here. The labyrinthine segment is likely to be injured even in temporal bone fractures. This can occur due to direct compression of the nerve due to bony fragments. So let us go to the tympanic segment. The tympanic segment of a facial nerve is about 8 to 11 millimeters long. It runs along the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve is 8 to 11 millimeters long. It runs the length of the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. It runs perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous bone. Mind you, this nerve is running perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous a portion of the temporal bone. It takes a posterior path, then inclines downwards. It starts to incline downwards and laterally from the genicular ganglion to the second genu or the level of the pyramid. So the tympanic segment begins at the level of the first genu or the genicular ganglion and then it runs along the length of the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. It is running perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous bone. It takes a posterior path and inclined downwards and lateral from the genicular ganglion to the second genu. The second genu is roughly at the level of the pyramid. So this is this is actually the facial nerve. So this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So proximally it lies just above and medial to the uh, posterior of the cochlear forms. So co processes cochlear form is actually vital landmark because it lies just anterior to the tympanic segment of the patient nerve. And processes cochlear form is really a reliable landmark to locate the tympanic segment of the patient nerve. It lies just anterior and below, just below the processes cochlear forms. Just above and sorry, it just lies above and medial to the process of cochlear forms. The patient now, tympanic segment of the patient now lies above and medial to the posterior edge of the cochlear forms. Distally, it lies above the wall window. Distally here, you see the now lying above the wall window. And then, and it is inferior to the prominence of the lateral semicircle. Now. This is lateral semicircle. Now. It lies inferior to the prominence of the lateral canal. It bends at the second genome to enter the stylet complex. At the level of the second genome, which is actually close to the pyramidal eminence, it enters the stylomastic prominence. Pyramidal eminence is actually a landmark for the second genome of the patient. 
Pyramidal elements actually land mark for the second general operation. So, team plan second operation is always injured in mass charge surgery when working close to the pyramidal elements. Sinus team plan lies medial to the anti medial and anterior to the facial canal. Sinus team plan actually lies medial and anterior to the facial canal. And the facial and lateral tympanic sinus, the facial sinus, facial recess, and the lateral tympanic sinus lies laterally posterior to the canal. So, this sinus tympani lies medial and anterior to the facial canal. Sinus tympani is a vital landmark, it lies medial to the medial and anterior to the facial canal. And then the facial recess and the lateral tympanic sinus lie laterally posterior to the canal. This is the lateral tympanic recess, this is the facial sinus, facial recess. So, they lie lateral and posterior to the canal. Let us come to the master segment. This master segment is around 10 to 14 millimeters long. It is also known as the vertical segment of the patient. Now, it is the longest of all the fetus segments. So, it runs vertically downwards. It runs vertically downwards along the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity and the anterior wall of the mastoid. It runs vertically downwards along the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity and the anterior wall of the Master, first of all, the tympanic cavity and anterior wall of the mastoid cavity are the same, one and the same. So it begins at the second genome. This is the level of the second genome, just distal to the pyramid. Just distal to the pyramid, it starts with second genome and then runs down to exit via the style of mastoid form and present the mastoid tip. See here, there is a vital landmark, bony landmark. There is a known as a digastric ridge raised by the digastric muscle. So the digastric ridge which lies just at the medial aspect of the mastoid tip. The gastric ridge lies at the medial aspect of the mastoid tip. It points to the lateral and inferior aspect of the mastoid segment of the facial nerve. The digastric ridge really indicates, points to the lateral and inferior aspect, lateral and inferior aspect of the facial nerve. So, this is the digastric ridge and this is the lateral and inferior aspect of the digastric ridge is a landmark for this facial nerve. The line drawn between the anterior end of the digastric ridge and the short process of incurs really path, uh, marks the path taken by the vertical segment of the patient. So, if you draw a line between the anterior end of the digastric ridge, this is the digastric ridge, if you draw a line from the anterior end, anterior end of the digastric ridge up to the short process of incurs, this is the post ridge where the short process of incurs resides, this is the aditus. So that is approximately the course taken by the vertical portion of the patient. Now. So important branches are given off at the vertical portion of the patient. Now. They are nervous stapedius, quadratic nerve, and sensitive auricular branch. So these three branches are given off from the vertical segment of the patient. Now. One is the nervous stapedius, the other one is a quadratic nerve, the third one is a sensitive auricular branch. let us go to the extra temporal portion of the facial nerve. Actually this exits, the uh, facial nerve exits from the stylum aside for a moment, enters the main trunk, enters the parotid gland, really high up on the posterior medial aspect. The main trunk exits from the stylum aside for a moment, it enters the parotid gland along its posterior medial surface, high up, it passes forwards and downwards behind the ramus of the mandible. Within the gland, it divides into two main branches, upper temporal facial and lower cervical facial trunk. Its length is around 8 to 22 millimeters. The following branches are given up by the main trunk. They are the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal mandibular and cervical. So these are really five branches. They are known as pes and serenus. These are known as pes and serenus, five feet. So, branches from the branches given by the facial nerve from within the parotid gland are the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal, mandibular, and cervical. Now, let us go to the blood supply of the facial nerve. The blood facial nerve receives blood supply from the vestibular, sorry, vestibular basilar system and the external. Carotid artery system. So it receives blood supply from vertebral basilar system, 
as well as an external operating arterial system. So labyrinth in artery, which is actually a branch of anterior inferior cerebral artery, supplies the cysternal portion. Labyrinth in artery, which is actually a branch of anterior inferior cerebral artery, supplies the cysternal portion, natal portion, labyrinth in segment. The tympanic and mastoid segment are supplied by the facial anastomotic arch formed by the superficial protrusal artery of the middle meningeal artery and the stylomaster branch of the occipital or post auricular artery. So I repeat again, uh, labyrinthine artery, which is actually a branch of the anterior inferior cerebral artery, it supplies the systemal portion, it supplies the meatal portion, it supplies the labyrinthine segment. Tympanic and mastoid segments are uh, supplied by the facial arch formed by the anastomotic network by the superficial petrosal arterial branch of the middle meningeal artery and the stylomastoid arterial branch which arises from the, either the occipital artery or the post artery. Now let us go to the pathophysiology of the patient of injury. Patient of can be injured either by trauma, can be compressed, can face injury due to traction, then can extremes of temperature, too hot or too cold, can cause uh, injury to the patient now. Local chemical exposure to chemical agents can cause facial injury. Then systemic causes of patient paralysis include vasculitis, diabetics mellitus, and then last but not the least is the ischemia or lack of cessation of blood supply to the facial nerve. Now, valerian degeneration is actually a degenerative process which the nerve distal to the injury undergoes. This is actually, this term has been, has been attributed to a great work of valor who described the reaction of the distal end of the nerve after injury on, in, after getting injured in a particular location. This he did extensive studies in glossophagy and hypoglossal nerve injury in straw and he demonstrated that the distal segment, the nerve segment which lies distal to the injury site of injury undergoes degeneration. So, this degeneration actually takes place along the nerve distal to injured site and then the axonal regrowth process can be impeded. Any nerve injured tries to regenerate, tries to regrow, but this process of regrowth can be impeded by endoneural fibrosis or aging, or aging mechanism which occurs in the Schwann cell. So what happens is here this diagram shows here the exact site of injury is here indicated by a lightning, symbol of lightning. What happens is that the segment distal to the site of injury has undergone degeneration. So what, what the major importance is the distal end, the degeneration process proceeds real fast. So if you want to perform a repair, the earlier the repair, the better will be the Regeneration. So time is muscle. The popular adage goes time is muscle. The earlier the intervention, better is going to be the result. So what are all the types of nerve injuries? Classification of the types of nerve injuries. So one is neuropraxia. Neuropraxia is actually a transient phenomenon which occurs due to compression or gradual stretching. Okay? No. So this is actually a physiological block. The axoplasmic transport and the iron channel mechanism are affected. So what happens is there is a transient block, physiological block for the transport of axoplasm as well as the ionic transport is affected. The functional nerve loss, functional loss of the nerve is purely temporary. As soon as the compression is released, these patients recover rapidly and regain the original function. So in neuropraxia, when the insert is removed, when the offending insert is removed, the recovery is really rapid and within hours the patient will be able to 
we gave the function. In axonotomesis, this can occur due to compression or gradual stretching for prolonged duration of time. So here the axonic physiological block which can cause obstruction to axoplasmic transport as well as ion channel functions, they are all affected. The functional loss is actually temporary, but the release of after you remove the compression, there is rapid recovery. But mind you, the, the insulting compression should be immediately relieved. The nerve should be decompressed with the immediate effect. Otherwise, the patient may not recover. So, the, there is a physio, in addition to physiologic block, the axoplasm flow is also blocked in these patients. Okay, let us come to neurotomesis. Here, the nerve is either completely cut or badly damaged by the disease process. Recovery without surgical intervention is virtually impossible. The axons as well as the connective tissue covering the axon are disrupted. Not only the axon is disrupted, the connective tissue is also disrupted. If the gap between the stump, proximal and the distal stump is wide, then you need to bridge that gap by nerve graft. Spontaneous regeneration is actually imperfect. It can cause syntinesis, it can cause uh, crocodile tears, it can cause gustatory sweating. Then 80% of the muscle volume of the facial muscle can be lost due to denervation. Nearly 80% of the muscle volume can be lost due to denervation. And cutaneous sensory receptors also regenerate slowly. So surgical repair is a must in patients with neurotomesis. Now Sunderland, we applied a classification. Actually this previous classification was Seddon's classification. He modified Seddon's classification. He added a few more categories to the category of axonotomesis to explain it better. Because axonotomesis he covered a few levels of injury. So it will in order to improve the accurate prognostic evaluation of the patient of lesions and that too in patients with axonotomesis, he derived this classification. According to Sunderland, grade 1 is actually neuropraxia of Seddon's criteria. In grade 2, axons degenerate distal to the site of the lesion. Whenever there is an insult, I have already told you, there is a certain amount of degeneration of the axon distal to the site of the lesion. And this is irrespective of the caliber of the endoneurium. Irrespective of the size of the endoneurium or the caliber of the endoneurium, this degeneration occurs. So there is loss of endoneurium, there is loss of perineurium, there is loss of epineurium. Perineurium is epineurium is intact. So what happens in grade 2 is the axons degeneration occurs, axons degenerate distal to the site of lesion. But endoneurium and perineurium are lost. Endoneurium and perineurium are lost. But the outer epineurium remains intact. So endoneurium and perineurium, connective tissues covering the nerve, the inner and the middle layer covering, namely the endoneurium and perineurium are lost, and the outer epineurium is intact. This outer epineurium is intact. Joint cell can grow through these epineural tubes. It can grow through these epineural tubes and can start the regenerative process. In grade 3, endoneurium is also disrupted. So, in addition to the epineurium and perineurium, the endoneurium also is obstructed. Here, the axon is degenerated, distant to the site of the lesion, and here the reparative process may not be that perfect. In grade 4, the perineurium is also affected and axons degenerated distance to the distant to the side of the lesion. In grade 5, the total loss is there and there is rapid degeneration of the nerve. Now let us go to the etiology of Patient of paralysis. Patient of paralysis can be present at birth, can be present due to trauma, can be caused by neurological causes, can be caused by infection, can be caused by metabolic causes, can be caused by neoplastic lesions, can be caused by toxic uh, exposure, can be caused by epigenic causes, 
than the idiopathic. So facial palsy at birth. Let us start from facial palsy at birth. Facial palsy at birth can be subclassified into congenital and traumatic facial nerve lesion in infants. So congenital causes are always associated, mind you, with other cranial nerves. Congenital causes of facial palsy is always associated with paralysis of other nerves, which includes third nerve, fourth nerve, fifth nerve, and eighth nerve. This syndrome is known as Mobius syndrome. In Mobius syndrome, there is hypoplasia of the motor nuclei of cranial nerves within the brainstem. So in Mobius syndrome, the motor nuclei of cranial nerves within the brainstem are affected and they are hypoplastic. This is due to hypoxic injury, hypoxic encephalopathy, which occurs during peripartum or intrapartum injury. Then, golden heart syndrome. This is also known as hemifacial microsmia. Here, there is congenital malformation involving structures derived from the first and the second arch. This occurs in addition to the facial paralysis. Then, the third cause of congenital facial paralysis syndrome, congenital pseudobulbar palsy, and then another one is the Arnold Chiari syndrome. Arnold Chiari syndrome also is manifested with congenital facial paralysis with the paralysis of the lower three cranial nerves. Lower three cranial nerves. Then let us come to traumatic facial palsy in infants. This is commonly caused due to forceps injury. Now, with the incidence of forceps delivery on the decline, this type of facial palsy is also on the decline. This is really commonly seen in high birth rate, birth rate infants. So, the birth weight of the child is more than 3.5 kg. Then these children have problem coming out of the normal vaginal introitus. So, you need to apply pressure to deliver the child. So, this type of traumatic facial palsy is common in obese children or children with birth weight of more than 3.5 kg. This is also common in preterm infants. Premature delivery, again, facial palsy is common. Prognosis is actually favorable. Again, this is a really favorable prognosis. And these children regain the facial nerve functions within the first few months of life. Now, trauma can cause damage to the facial nerve. So, skull based fracture, facial injuries can cause damage to the facial nerve. That is, uh, when the facial nerve lies within the substance of the parotid gland, injury to the face can cause uh, damage to the individual fibers of the facial nerve. Then, penetrating medullary injuries can cause uh, facial nerve palsy, barotrauma and middle trauma due to scuba diving also can cause facial nerve diseases. Now let us go to the neurological cause of facial nerve. The first common cause, neurological cause involving the facial nerve into the upper class syndrome. Here the bilateral corticobulbar paralysis is there. These patients have automatic and reflex movements of the facial muscles but these lesions, these patients have lesions involving the opercular area of the brain. So these patients have lesions involving the opercular area of the brain. But even though there is present facial paralysis, automatic and reflex movement are intact in opercular syndrome. In miller Brugger syndrome, these patients have facial nerve as well as abduction nerve paralysis, including hemiplegia. So this is also known as ventral pontine syndrome. So miller Brugger syndrome is also known as ventral pontine syndrome. Here, these patients will have facial paralysis along with abduction nerve paralysis along with hemiplegia. So, this condition is caused by tumors, infections, and demyelinating diseases involving the ventral pons. Now, what are all the infective lesions that can lead to facial nerve paralysis? Arthritis external, particularly malignant arthritis external, can lead to facial palsy. Arthritis media, both acute and chronic. In mastitis, in chickenpox, Ramsey Hunt syndrome, then mumps, infectious mononucleosis, and HIV. These are all the infections that can cause visual paralysis. Let us go to metabolic causes. Some of the common metabolic causes of facial paralysis include diabetes mellitus, hyperthyroidism, pregnancy, hypertension, and acute porphyria. 
Now, neoplastic calcification of paralysis. Tumors involved in the carotid gland can cause facial paralysis. Polycytoma of the midlayer cavity can cause facial paralysis. Tumors involved in the patient now, exonomous can cause facial paralysis. Glomus duplet or other cerebellar fontaine angle tumor like acoustic neuroma can cause facial paralysis. Leukemia can cause facial paralysis. Meningioma, hemangioblastoma, aneurysm involved in the carotid artery, and fibrous dysplasia can cause facial paralysis. Now, toxic causes of facial paralysis include exposure to Taldomide, exposure to ethylene glycol, alcoholism, arsenic intoxication, tetanus, diphtheria, carbon monoxide. So these are all the toxic agents that can cause facial paralysis. Hydrogen cause of facial paralysis include the autological surgeries, including mastectomy, stipidectomy, and then peritone surgery. Again, another common cause of facial paralysis. Then Mandibular block anesthesia when you attempt to reduce uh, mandibular block can inadvertently uh, cause facial paralysis by injecting uh, local anesthesia close in close proximity to the patient. And of course, mandibular block anesthesia, the facial palsy is transient, which uh, the patient will recover as soon as the effect of local anesthesia wears. So, anti tetanic serum again can cause uh, facial paralysis. After immunization, the patient can develop facial paralysis. Embolization can cause facial paralysis. And that too in the labyrinth in segment of the patient. Now let us go to the clinical features of the facial paralysis. Here, this is classically a facial paralysis of lower motor neuron type. This is the right facial paralysis. Here you see high end of based on the upper aspect here that is the wrinkling of forehead seen in the normal wrinkling is seen on the left side the wrinkling of forehead is lost on the right side the patient has the inability to close the right eye and then the angle of the mouth deviates to the opposite side as soon as seen here so this patient they uh, because of the inefficient or paralyzed orbicular ovaries the saliva tends to dribble saliva tends to dribble and mind you these patients will have inability to close the affected eye. So what happens? I cannot close. The lid won't close. So this causes excessive dryness. In addition to the lack of uh, tears, these patients are not able to close the eye. When the patient is not able to close the eye, then there is always a possibility of cornea getting affected, the eye getting dry. So physiologically what happens is, in these patients, the eye tends to roll up. The eye tends to roll up, try to hide the cornea under the uh, superior uh, lid. So this rolling up, eyeball rolling up phenomenon is known as Bell's phenomenon. So Bell's phenomenon is classically seen in these patients. So what happens, this is actually a protective mechanism to protect corneal injury. So in these patients, since the patient is not able to close the eyelid, the cornea tends to move up. The cornea tends to move up, just get underneath the upper eyelid. So this is known as rolling up the eye or Bell's phenomenon. And there is, uh, as I have already told you, there is a reduction of tearing in the epsilon, right? There is deviation of the angle of the mouth to the opposite side. There is drooling. There is metallic test because the anterior two third of the tongue is supplied by thyroid and tonic nerve, which is a branch of facial nerve. So these patients are metallic test. So facial nerve can be, facial paralysis can be recurrent. So Bell's palsy or idiopathic facial palsy is uh, can recur. In fact, it is 2. Point, occurrence is uh, 2.5 times more common in patients with the family history of Bell's palsy or facial paralysis. The second cause of recurrent facial palsy is Melchers and Rosenthal syndrome. Here, these patients have alternating recurrent facial palsy. It affects one side, it recovers, then affects the other side, it recovers. So this is actually these patients can be identified by the classic presence of fissured tongue. So, Melchers and Rosenthal syndrome facial palsy can be identified by the presence of fissured tongue. The tumors involving the brain, like cerebral lymphoma, can cause recurrent facial paralysis. And then, herpes simplex type 1 infections involving genital ganglion can cause recurrent facial paralysis. Now, while eliciting history, these patients classically give history of ear pain. 
they will give history of direct PCR or numbness on the affected side. They will be giving the history of taste disturbance in the confined to the anterior root of the tongue. They can be giving history of presence of rash in the posterior wall of the ear or the anterior pillar of the tonsil, posterior pharyngeal wall, or anterior two third of the tongue. And these patients also can give history of hyperacusis because of the paralysis involved in the stapedis muscle. And then these patients give history of recurrent recent viral infection. And the presence of other cranial nerve involvements can also be seen in these patients. Now, examination, one should examine all the cranial nerves. Once when you see a patient with facial palsy, it is imperative on your part to examine all the cranial nerves. Then you should examine the taste. Then you should grade the facial weakness. This grading of the facial weakness will help in deciding the prognosis and also in help in deciding the treatment modality. Complete ear, nose, throat examination also should be done. Now, the facial palsy again can be graded as per house Brackman classification. House Brackman said grade 1, it is normal symmetrical function and normally functioning facial nerve. In grade 2, it is mild dysfunction, it is very barely noticeable, there is slight weakness of the facial muscles and it is noticeable only on close inspection. The eye closure is really complete, the patient is able to close eye with minimum effect, but what happens is there is slight asymmetry of the face. This is uh, this asymmetry is visible only to a discerning eye. And these patients can have synkinesis, but synkinesis is barely noticeable. There can be contractures seen, but the spasm is not there. These patients they don't uh, uh, manifest any patient or spasm. Then moderate dysfunction or grade 3, the, there is obvious weakness of the facial muscles, and that is evident when, when you ask the patient to. Uh, hold air inside the mouth. The patient won't be able to hold the air inside the mouth because of the weakness of the orbicularis oris. So there is weakness, muscular weakness, but it is not so disfiguring. These patients may not be able to lift the eyebrow. These patients may not be able to lift the eyebrow and complete eye closure and uh, is not here. The patient is, has partial eye closure and they will they be able to close eye with maximal effect on it, maximal effort rather. They will have to use maximal effort to keep the eye closed. But uh, there is no disfiguring synchronisis. In grade 4, there is moderately severe dysfunction. There is obvious weakness, disfiguring weakness rather. The patient is not able to lift up the eyebrow. There is incomplete eye closure and there is Synchinesis, severe synchinesis, mass movement, and when the patient is uh, attempting to close the eye, there will be a deviation of the angle of the mouth. Then in grade 5, there is severe dysfunction, motion barely perceptible, there is total paralysis, eye closure is incomplete, there is slight movement of the corner of the mouth, Bell's phenomenon is evident in this patient. In total paralysis, there is no movement at all, there is total loss of muscle tone, synchinesis, and uh, contracture or pain is also seen in these patients. Management involves classically investigations and treatment. So, investigations. First thing is while you investigate a patient, you need to investigate the pro to find out the probable level of the patient nomination, where exactly the patient now is involved or affected. So the test which helps us to identify the probable area of involvement of patient now is known as topognostic test. So let us see the topognostic, topognostic test that helps to identify the location of the nerve injury. The first topognostic test which you commonly do is the Schirmer's test. This test helps us to test the integrity of the greater superficial petrosal branch of the patient. So how will you ever exactly perform this test? So you use strips of filter paper. This filter paper's uh, width is around uh, 2 uh, 3 millimeters, 2.5 to 3 millimeters and then the length is around uh, 
10 millimeters it is kept the inferior conjunctive and fornix you keep these filter papers into a hook to the lower conjunctive fornix you keep it for 5 minutes and you can measure the length of the paper that will be moistened and you compare it with the other eye supposing if there is 75% unilateral decrease in the lateral emission it indicates that there is long deficient lateral emission in that eye and then if there is a bilateral decrease see so bilateral decrease can be ascertained if the lateral emission is less than 10 mm wetted for both sides at 5 minutes so if there is less than 10 mm wetting on both sides it shows that there is a bilateral decrease in lateral emission so your schrimmer test tells us not only whether lateral emission is affected to one side in that case there will be 75% less wetness and compared to the normal light and when there is a total of uh, less than 10 mm wetting on both sides it goes to saying there is lack of deficient lateral emission in both sides then next comes the stepidate reflex the stepidate reflex tests the integrity of the nerve to stepidates this can be easily tested by impedance audiometry uh, you can assess whether the nerve to stepidates is Uh, acting in has integrity or not has connectivity or not and then electrocustometry test the sensation of taste in the anterior two third of the tongue and this is uh, a test to uh, uh, test for the integrity of the coronary parenchyma then you can test for salivary flow this can be again done by candulating the warten stuff and reduction in 25% is considered to be abnormal you just candulate the warten stuff then you measure the salivary flow over the time you use a gustatory stimulus like keeping a small chocolate under the tongue the reduction of 25% is considered to be abnormal the salivary flow test and the electrogustometry test for the integrity of the cordate tympani no so if the schrimmer's test is uh, negative what it indicates it indicates the lesion is at the level of the geniculate ganglion is at the level of geniculate ganglion or it in it is in fact a level above the geniculate ganglion if the if the damage is at the level of geniculate ganglion or higher than the level of geniculate ganglion the schrimmer test will be negative the stepidial reflex again if the lesion is occurs somewhere between the geniculate ganglion on the second genu of the patient you know, septal reflex is absent and then electrogustometry again for a tip line now is given off from the tympanic segment of the patient now so if the electrogustometry proves that the taste is uh, normal then the lesion can be uh, uh, the lesion can could have occurred at a level below the level of the exit of the carotid parenchyma and then salivary flow testing it tells us again the integrity of the carotid parenchyma so if the salivary flow is normal it shows that the level of the lesion is below that of the level where the carotid tympanic nerve has generated from the patient also this approximately tells us the probable location of damage of the patient now now let us go to the diagnostic test the diagnostic test can be imaging both ct and mri both ct and mri are very important diagnostic test then you can perform electroneuronography and electromyography and these two tests are very important to decide the prognosis of the lesion as well as to decide whether active intervention is needed or not then cutone audiometry is done to rule out media pathology and then transcranial magnetic stimulation is performed to test for the integrity of the cranial component of the patient now cranial component of the patient take it as a cranial component of the patient now can be assessed by transcranial magnetic stimulation now coming to the treatment it depends on the cause the main problem is you should treat the complications caused by the facial nerve paralysis first thing is the ideal way to treat complications is to prevent the complication from arising in the first place so 
most common dreaded complication of facial nerve paralysis is the exposure directly that is because of the inability of the patient to close the eye so this can be prevented the damage to the eye can be prevented by uh, protecting the eye giving the patient protective goggles with side protection so that the cornea will be protected or you can use an eye cap to close that eye and then on a long term basis you can use weighted objects to hold the uh, upper lip down inferiorly so you can use uh, platinum weight you can use gold weight so that it, you can hold the lid down so that the eye close the lower uh, lid will compensate and close the eye lid totally then physiotherapy can be advised to prevent uh, muscular wasting and then patient nerve decompression can be carried out or patient nerve anastomosis can be carried out depending on the electrophysiological findings so what do you mean by electrophysiological findings if the electromyography shows uh, no action potential it goes without saying the recovery is going to be really very poor so you need to uh, go ahead and uh, do a surgical repair if the electroneuronography is silent if the electroneuronography is silent that is notorious not it is really notorious because it indicates no stimulus is passing and there is going to be further damage uh, to the musculature volume of the muscle so these patients should undergo immediate decompression or the facial nerve anastomosis and in the case of uh, long standing facial nerve anastomosis uh, facial nerve paralysis these the facial nerve decompression or facial nerve uh, anastomosis is not possible it won't give the desired result you can resort to facial reanimation techniques where you use uh, muscle sling in appropriate areas to ensure that portion of the face uh, musculature will be compensated by these muscular slings and here the plastic surgeon's role is really vital thank you it is professional now i am restarting the entire lecture right now because of the power outage i need to stop let us start from the labyrinthine segment while i was explaining the labyrinthine segment i erroneously pointed out the tympanic portion as the labyrinthine segment let me tell you the length of the labyrinthine segment is about 3 to 5 mm it happens to be the shortest of the facial nerve segments and it is also the narrowest portion of the facial nerve segment it starts from the internal medial and lateral end of the internal acoustic nerve and lasts up to the first ear this is actually the portion of the labyrinthine segment not this this is the labyrinthine segment and this is the shortest and the narrowest portion it also lacks the anastomotic arcadial arterial cascade it does not have anastomotic arterial cascades so thereby it is vulnerable in its blood supply so this area of the facial nerve namely from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerve up to the first you know is the most vulnerable portion of the facial nerve and this accounts for nearly 43% of the facial nerve paralysis it is more vascular insults are commonly seen in this area this is involved due to edema of the facial nerve and moreover the nerve does not have any space to expand because it is the narrowest portion of the facial nerve so here the distal end of the labyrinthine segment that is here there is a hairpin bend that is a pulp gel and that is actually the pulp gel of the facial nerve formed by the genicular ganglion so here this pulp gel is created behind by the superior semicircular nerve and anteriorly by the cochlea and inferiorly also by the cochlea so I repeat again the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve starts from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerve and extends up to the first ear nerve i stand corrected i had pointed erroneously this portion as the labyrinthine portion is actually this portion this short portion starting from the lateral portion of the internal acoustic nerve up to the first ear this genicular ganglia or the first genome 
is cradled by the superior semicircuit canal posteriorly and cochlea anteriorly and inferiorly. And this portion of the nerve can be accompanied by subarachnoid space up to the level of the genicular ganglion. Up to the level of the genicular ganglion, the subarachnoid space from the brain can accompany. That is due to the genicular ganglion. The genicular ganglion, I already told you, the sensory ganglion, it does not contain any synapses. That is very important. It does not contain synapses. The central processes of general sensory neurons in the ganglion, they carry pain and sensations in the external artery canal. They terminate somatically in the spinal tract of the trigeminal. So, general sensory of the neurons travels in the genital ganglion, carrying pain from the external artery canal and they terminate in the spinal tract of trigeminal. In central process of somatic visceral affront, they carry taste fibers from the anterior root of the button via the cauda tendon and they also mount to somatically, somat somatotopically, they stop at the second order neuron in the gustatory nucleus. The gustatory nucleus happens to be at the rostral end of the tractus solitaris. The cauda tendon is thought to modulate actually the trigeminal and plus sensitive sensitivity. The preganglionic parasympathetic axons, they are distinct to sign up at the postganglionic neurons either in the pericopalatine fossa or in the submandibular ganglion. So these nerves, preganglionic parasympathetic axons, traverse through the basal nerve and they don't sign up at the genicular ganglion, but they sign up at the level of the pericopalatine ganglion and the submandibular ganglion. These fibers carry secret the motor fibers to the lacrimal gland and the salivary glands. Let us go to the apply the anatomy of the genicular ganglion. Genicular ganglion actually lies in a fossa which is covered by very thin layer of bone. So this thin layer of bone separates the genicular ganglion from the middle cranial fossa. Daily sensors are common in this area. So daily sense actually what happens is it can make this area of ganglion vulnerable in middle cranial fossa surgery. So whenever you are attempting to do a middle cranial, middle cranial fossa surgery, daily sense in this area can lead to risk of damaging the genicular ganglion. So enlarged genicular ganglion fossa when seen in CT actually should strengthen the diagnosis of genicular ganglion fossa fracture in patients with traumatic facial palsy. So in patients with traumatic facial palsy if you do a CT and you see the uh, genicular ganglion fossa slightly enlarged, it really strengthens the diagnosis that there is a damage to this ganglion due to trauma. And during translabyrinth surgeries, the labyrinth uh, portion of the patient you know, is at risk. That too, when you are drilling up along the semicircle, superior semicircle canal, like because the genicular ganglion lies perilously close to the anterior portion of the superior semicircle canal. Like so, the genicular ganglion lies anterior to the superior semicircle like canal. So, during translabyrinth surgery, the labyrinth uh, segment is at risk here. The labyrinthine segment is likely to be injured even in temporal bone fractures. This can occur due to direct compression of the nerve due to bony fragments. So let us go to the tympanic segment. The tympanic segment of a facial nerve is about 8 to 11 millimeters long. It runs along the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve is 8 to 11 millimeters long. It runs the length of the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. It runs perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous bone. Mind you, this nerve is running perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous portion of the temporal bone. It takes a posterior path, then inclines downwards. It starts to incline downwards and laterally from the genicular ganglion to the second genu or the level of the pyramid. So the tympanic segment begins at the level of the first genu or the genicular ganglion and then it runs along the length of the superior edge of the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. It is running perpendicular to the long axis of the petrous bone. It takes a posterior path and incline downwards and lateral from the genicular ganglion to the second genu. The second genu is roughly at the level of the pyramid. So this is this is actually the facial nerve. So, this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. This is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So, proximally, 
it lies just above and median to the uh, posterior edge of the cochlear forms. So co processes cochlear form is actually a vital landmark because it lies just anterior to the tympanic segment of the patient nerve. And processes cochlear form is really a reliable landmark to locate the tympanic segment of the patient nerve. It lies just anterior and below, just below the processes cochlear forms. Just above and sorry, it just lies above and medial to the processes cochlear forms. The patient now, tympanic segment of the patient now lies above and medial to the posterior edge of the cochlear forms. Distally, it lies above the wall window. Distally, here you see the nerve lying above the wall window, and then and it is inferior to the prominence of the lateral semicircular nerve. This is lateral semicircular nerve. It lies inferior to the prominence of the lateral canal. It bends at the second genome to enter the stylet complex. At the level of the second genome, which is actually close to the pyramidal eminence, it enters the stylomastoid prominence. Pyramidal eminence is actually a landmark for the second genome of the patient. Now. Pyramidal eminence is actually a landmark for the second genome of the patient. Now. So, the implant segment of the patient now is always injured in mastoid surgery when working close to the pyramidal eminence. Sinus tympani lies medial to the anti medial and anterior to the facial canal. Sinus tympani actually lies medial and anterior to the facial canal. And the facial and lateral tympanic, uh, tympanic sinuses, facial sinus, facial recess, and the lateral tympanic sinus lies laterally posterior to the canal. So this sinus tympani lies medial and anterior to the facial canal. Sinus tympani is a vital landmark. It lies medial to the medial and anterior to the facial canal and then the facial recess and the lateral tympanic sinus lie lateral and posterior to the canal this is the lateral tympanic recess this is the facial sinus facial recess so they lie lateral and posterior to the canal let us come to the mastoid segment this mastoid segment is around 10 to 14 millimeters long it is also known as the vertical segment of the patient now. It is the longest of all the pretrus segments. So it runs vertically downwards. It runs vertically downwards along the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity and the anterior wall of the mastoid. It runs vertically downwards along the posterior wall of the tympanic cavity and the anterior wall of the mastoid. Posterior wall of the tympanic cavity and anterior wall of the mastoid cavity are the same, one and the same. So it begins at the second genome. This is the level of the second genome. Just distal to the pyramid. Just distal to the pyramid. It starts with second genome and then runs down to exit via the style of mastoid form and present the mastoid tip. See here there is a vital landmark, bony landmark. There is a known as a digastric ridge raised by the digastric muscle. So the digastric ridge which lies just at the medial aspect of the mastoid tip. Diagastic which lies at the medial aspect of the mastoid tip. It points to the lateral and inferior aspect of the mastoid segment of the patient now. The diagastic which really indicates points to the lateral and inferior aspect. Lateral and inferior aspect of the patient now. So this is the diagastic which and this is the lateral and inferior aspect of the diagastic which is a landmark for this patient now. The line drawn between the anterior end of the diagastic which and the short process of incurs really path, uh, marks the path taken by the vertical segment of the patient. Now. So, if you draw a line between the anterior end of the diagastric ridge, mm -hmm. this is the diagastric ridge. If you draw a line from the anterior end, anterior end of the diagastric ridge up to the short process of incurs, this is the post ridge where the short process of incurs resides. This is the aditus. So, that is approximately the course taken by the vertical portion of the patient. Now. So, important branches are given off at the vertical portion of the patient now. They are nervous stepidus, quadratic nerve, and sensitive auricular branch. So, these three branches are given off from the vertical segment of the patient now. One is the nervous stepidus, the other one is a quadratic nerve, the other one is a sensitive auricular branch. Now let us go to the extra temporal portion of the patient. Actually, this exits the uh, patient now exits from the stylum aspect for a enters the main trunk, enters the parotid gland, really high up on the posterior medial aspect. The main trunk exits from the stylum aspect for a it enters the parotid gland, 
along its posterior medial surface, high up, it passes forwards and downwards behind the ramus of the mandible. Within the gland, it divides into two main branches, upper temporal fissure and lower cervical fissure trunk. Its length is around 8 to 22 millimeters. The following branches are given up by the main trunk. They are the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal mandibular, and cervical. So these are really five branches. They are known as pes cancerinus. These are known as pes cancerinus, five feet. So branches from the branches given by the facial nerve from within the parotid gland are the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal mandibular, and cervical. Now let us go to the blood supply of the facial nerve. The blood spatial now receives blood supply from the vestibular, vertebral, sorry, vertebral basilar system and the external carotid artery system. So it receives blood supply from vertebral basilar system as well as the external carotid arterial system. So labyrinthine artery, which is actually a branch of anterior inferior cerebral artery, supplies the cisternal portion. Labyrinthine artery, which is actually a branch of anterior inferior cerebellar artery, supplies the cisternal portion, natal portion, labyrinthine segment. The tympanic and mastoid segment are supplied by the facial anastomotic arch formed by the superficial protrusal artery of the middle meningeal artery and the stylomastoid branch of the occipital or post auricular artery. So I repeat again, uh, labyrinthine artery, which is actually a branch of the anterior inferior cerebral artery, it supplies the cisternal portion it supplies a meatal portion, it supplies a labyrinthine segment. Tympanic and mastoid segments are uh, supplied by the facial arch formed by the anastomotic network by the superficial petrosal arterial branch of the middle meningeal artery and the stylomastoid arterial branch which arises from the, either the occipital artery or the post artery. Now, let us go to the pathophysiology of facial nerve injury. Facial nerve can be injured either by trauma, can be compressed, can face injury due to traction, then can extremes of temperature, too hot or too cold, can cause uh, injury to the facial nerve. Local chemical exposure to chemical agents can cause facial injury. Then systemic causes of facial nerve paralysis include vasculitis, Diabetic mellitus, and then last but not the least is the ischemia or lack of cessation of blood supply to the facial nerve. Now, valerian degeneration is actually a degenerative process which the nerve distal to the injury undergoes. This is actually this term has been, has been attributed to a great work of valor who describe the reaction of the distal end of the nerve after injury on, in, after getting injured in a particular location. This he did extensive studies in glossophagy and hypoglossal nerve injury in straw and he demonstrated that the distal segment, the nerve segment which lies distal to the injury, site of injury undergoes degeneration. So, this degeneration actually takes place along the nerve distal to injured site and then the axonal regrowth process can be impeded. Any nerve injured tries to regenerate, tries to regrow, but this process of regrowth can be impeded by endoneural fibrosis or aging. Uh, aging mechanism which occurs in the Schwann cell. So what happens is here this diagram shows here the exact site of injury is here indicated by a lightning, symbol of lightning. What happens is that the segment distal to the site of injury has undergone degeneration. So what, what the major importance is the distal end, the degeneration process proceeds real fast. So, if you want to perform a repair, the earlier the repair, the better will be the regeneration. So, time is muscle. The popular adage goes, time is muscle. 
the earlier the intervention better is going to be the result so what are all the types of nerve injuries classification of the types of nerve injuries so one is neuropraxia neuropraxia is actually a transient phenomenon which occurs due to compression or gradual stretching of the nerve so this is actually a physiological block the axoplasmic transport on the iron channel mechanism are affected so what happens is there is a transient block physiological block for the transport of axoplasm as well as the ionic transport is affected the functional nerve loss functional loss of the nerve is purely temporary as soon as the compression is released these patients recover rapidly and regain their original function so in neuropraxia when the insert is removed when the offending insert is removed the recovery is really rapid and within hours the patient will be able to regain the function in axonotomesis this can occur due to compression or gradual stretching for prolonged duration of time so here the axonic physiological block which can cause obstruction to axoplasmic transport as well as ion channel functions they are all affected the functional loss is actually temporary but the release of after you remove the compression there is rapid recovery but mind you that the insulting compression should be immediately relieved the nerve should be decompressed with immediate effect otherwise the patient may not recover so the there is a physio in addition to physiologic block the axoplasm flow is also blocked in these patients okay let us come to neurotomesis here the nerve is either completely cut or badly damaged by the disease process recovery without surgical intervention is virtually impossible the axons as well as the connective tissue covering the axon are disrupted not only the axon is disrupted the connective tissue is also disrupted if the gap between the stump proximal and the distal stump is wide then you need to bridge that gap by nerve graft spontaneous regeneration is actually imperfect it can cause syncytiasis it can cause uh, crocodile tears it can cause gastritis sweating the 80% of the muscle volume of the facial muscle can be lost due to denervation nearly 80% of the muscle volume can be lost due to denervation and cutaneous sensory receptors also regenerate slowly so surgical repair is a must in patients with neurotomesis now sunderland we applied a classification actually this previous classification was sedans classification he modified sedans classification he added a few more category to the category of axonotomesis to explain it better because axonotomesis he covered a few levels of injury so it will in order to improve the accurate prognostic evaluation of the patient of lesions and that too in patients with axonotomesis he derived this classification according to sunderland grade 1 is actually neuropraxia of sedans criteria in grade 2 axons degenerate distal to the site of the lesion whenever there is an insert i already told you there is that amount of degeneration of the axon distal to the site of the lesion and this is irrespective of the caliber of the endoneurium irrespective of the size of the endoneurium or the caliber of the endoneurium this degeneration occurs so there is loss of endoneurium there is loss of perineurium there is loss of epineurium there is perineurium is epineurium is intact so what happens in grade 2 is the axons degeneration occurs axons degenerate distal to the site of lesion but endoneurium and perineurium are lost endoneurium and perineurium are lost but the outer epineurium remains intact so endoneurium and perineurium connective tissues covering the nerve the inner and the middle layer covering namely the endoneurium and perineurium are lost and the outer epineurium is intact this outer epineurium is intact joint cell can grow through this epineural tubes it can grow through this epineural tubes and can 
start the regenerative process. In grade 3, endoneurium is also disrupted. So, in addition to the epineurium and perineurium, the endoneurium also is obstructed. Here, the axon is degenerated, distant to the site of the lesion, and here the reparative process may not be that perfect. In grade 4, the perineurium is also affected and axons degenerated distance to the distant to the side of the lesion. In grade 5, the total loss is there and there is rapid degeneration of the nerve. Let us go to the etiology of patient apparatus. Patient apparatus can be present at birth, can be present due to trauma, can be caused by neurological causes, can be caused by infection, can be caused by metabolic causes, can be caused by neoplastic lesions, can be caused by toxic uh, exposure, can be caused by electrogenic causes, can be idiopathic. So, facial palsy at birth. Let us start from facial palsy at birth. Facial palsy at birth can be subclassified into congenital and traumatic facial nerve lesion in infants. So, congenital causes are always associated, mind you, with other cranial nerves. Congenital causes of facial palsy is always associated with paralysis of other nerves, which includes third nerve, fourth nerve, fifth nerve, and eighth nerve. This syndrome is known as Mobius syndrome. In Mobius syndrome, there is hypoplasia of the motor nuclei of cranial nerves within the brainstem. So, in Mobius syndrome, the motor nuclei of cranial nerves within the brainstem are affected and they are hypoplastic. This is due to hypoxic injury, hypoxic encephalopathy, which occurs during peripartum or intrapartum injury. Then, Golden Heart syndrome, this is also known as hemifacial microsmia. Here, there is congenital malformation involving structures derived from the first and the second arch. This occurs in addition to the facial paralysis. Then, the third cause of congenital facial paralysis syndrome, congenital pseudobulbar palsy, and then another one is the Arnold Chiari syndrome. Arnold Chiari syndrome also is manifested with congenital facial paralysis with the paralysis of the lower three cranial nerves. Lower three cranial nerves. Then, let us come to traumatic facial palsy in infants. This is commonly caused due to forceps injury. Now, with the incidence of forceps delivery on the decline, this type of facial palsy is also on the decline. This is really commonly seen in high birth weight, birth weight infants. So, the birth weight of the child is more than 3.5 kg. Then these children have problem coming out of the normal vaginal introitus. So, you need to apply pressure to deliver the child. So, this type of traumatic facial palsy is common in obese children or children with birth weight of more than 3.5 kg. This is also common in preterm infants. Premature delivery, again, facial palsy is common. Prognosis is actually favorable. Again, this is a really favorable prognosis, and these children regain the facial nerve functions within the first few months of life. Now, trauma can cause damage to the facial nerve. So, skull based fracture, facial injuries can cause damage to the facial nerve. That is, uh, when the facial nerve lies within the substance of the parotid gland, injury to the face can cause uh, damage to the individual fibers of the facial nerve. Then, penetrating medullary injuries can cause uh, facial nerve palsy, barotrauma and middle trauma due to scuba diving also can cause facial nerve diseases. Now let us go to the neurological cause of facial nerve. The first common cause, neurological cause involving the facial nerve into the upper class syndrome. Here the bilateral corticobulbar paralysis is there. These patients have automatic and reflex movements of the facial muscles but these lesions, these patients have lesions involving the opercular area of the brain. So, these patients have lesions involving the opercular area of the brain. But even though there is present facial paralysis, automatic and reflex movement are intact in opercular syndrome. In Miller-Brugger syndrome, 
these patients have facial nerve as well as abduction nerve paralysis including hemiplegia so this is also known as ventral pontine syndrome so miller duper syndrome is also known as ventral pontine syndrome here these patients will have facial paralysis along with abduction nerve paralysis along with hemiplegia so this condition is caused by tumors infections and demyelinating diseases involving the ventral pons now what are all the infective lesions that can lead to facial nerve paralysis arthritis eczema particularly malignant arthritis eczema can lead to facial palsy arthritis media both acute and chronic in mastitis in chicken pox ramsey hunt syndrome then mumps infectious mononucleosis and hiv these are all the infection that can cause facial paralysis let us go to metabolic causes some of the common metabolic causes of facial nerve paralysis include diabetes mellitus hyperthyroidism pregnancy hypertension and acute heart failure now neoplastic causes of facial nerve paralysis tumors involving the carotid gland can cause facial paralysis polycytoma of the medullary cavity can cause facial nerve paralysis tumors involving the facial nerve axonomas can cause facial nerve paralysis glomus jugular or other cerebellar pontine angle tumor like acoustic neuroma can cause facial nerve paralysis leukemia can cause facial nerve paralysis meningioma hemangioblastoma aneurysm involving the carotid artery and fibrous dysplasia can cause facial nerve paralysis Now, toxic causes of facial nerve paralysis include exposure to thalidomide, exposure to ethylene glycol, alcoholism, arsenic intoxication, tetanus, diphtheria, carbon monoxide. So these are all the toxic agents that can cause facial paralysis. Hydrogen causes of facial paralysis include the autological surgeries, including mastectomy, stipedectomy, and then. Carotid surgery again another common cause of facial nerve paralysis. Then mandibular block anesthesia when you attempt to reduce mandibular block can inadvertently uh, cause facial paralysis by injecting uh, local anesthesia close in close proximity to the facial nerve. And of course mandibular block anesthesia the facial palsy is transient, which uh, the patient will recover as soon as the effect of local anesthesia wears. anti tetanic serum again can cause uh, facial nerve paralysis after immunization the patient can develop facial paralysis embolization can cause facial paralysis and that too in the labyrinth in segment of the patient now let us go to the clinical features of the facial nerve paralysis here this is classically a facial nerve paralysis of lower motor neuron type This is the right patient of paralysis. Here you see eye and dot face on the upper aspect. Here that is the wrinkling of forehead seen in the normal wrinkling is seen on the left side. The wrinkling of forehead is lost on the right side. The patient has inability to close the right eye, and then the angle of the mouth deviates to the opposite side as seen as seen here. So this patient they. Uh, because of the inefficient or paralyzed orbicular ovaries the saliva tends to dribble saliva tends to dribble and mind you these patients will have inability to close the affected eye so what happens i cannot close the lid won't close so this causes excessive dryness in addition to the lack of uh, tears these patients are not able to close the eye when the patient is not able to close the eye then there is always a possibility of cornea getting affected the eye getting dry so physiologically what happens is in these patients the eye tends to roll up the eye tends to roll up try to hide the cornea under the uh, superior uh, lid so this rolling up eyeball rolling up phenomenon is known as bell's phenomenon so bell's phenomenon is classically seen in these patients so what happens this is actually a protective mechanism to protect corneal injury so in these patients since the patient is not able to close the eye lid the cornea tends to move up the cornea tends to move up just get underneath the upper eyelid so this is known as rolling up the eye or bell's phenomenon and there is uh, as i have already told you there is a reduction of tearing in the epilateral eye there is deviation of the angle of mouth to the opposite side there is drooling 
There is metallic test which is at the two third of the tonic is supplied by product and tonic now, which is a branch of patient now. So these patients are metallic test. So facial now can be facial paralysis can be recurrent. So Bell's palsy or idiopathic facial palsy is uh, can recur. In fact, it is two point recurrence is uh, 2.5 times more common in patients with the family history of Bell's palsy or facial paralysis. The second cause of recurrent facial palsy is Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome. Here, these patients have alternating recurrent facial palsy. It affects one side, it recovers, then affects the other side, it recovers. So, this is actually, these patients can be identified by the classic presence of fissured tongue. So, Melkerson Rosenthal syndrome facial palsy can be identified by the presence of fissured tongue. The tumors involving the brain, like cerebral lymphoma, can cause recurrent facial paralysis. And then happy simplex type 1 infections involving genital ganglion can cause recurrent facial paralysis. Now, while eliciting history, these patients classically will give history of ear pain, they will give history of paresthesia or numbness on the affected side, they will be giving history of taste disturbance in the confined to the anterior root of the tongue, they can be giving history of presence of rash in the posterior wall of the ear or the anterior pillar of the tonsil, posterior pharyngeal wall, or anterior two third of the tongue. And these patients also can give history of hyperacusis because of the paralysis involving the stapedis muscle. And then these patients give history of recurrent recent viral infection. And the presence of other cranial nerve involvements can also be seen in these patients. Now, examination, one should examine all the cranial nerves. Once when you see a patient with facial palsy, it is imperative on your part to examine all the cranial nerves. Then you should examine the taste. Then you should grade the facial weakness. This grading of the facial weakness will help in deciding the prognosis and also in help in deciding the treatment modality. Complete ear, nose, throat examination also should be done. Now, the facial palsy again can be graded as per house Brackman classification. House Brackman said grade 1 it is normal symmetrical function and normally functioning facial nerve. In grade 2 it is mild dysfunction, it is very barely noticeable, there is slight weakness of the facial muscles and it is noticeable only on close inspection. The eye closure is really complete, the patient is able to close eye with minimum effect but what happens is there is slight asymmetry of the face. This is uh, this asymmetry is visible only to a discerning eye, and these patients can have synkinesis, but synkinesis is barely noticeable. There can be contractures seen, but the spasm is not there. These patients they don't uh, uh, manifest any facial nerve spasm. Then moderate dysfunction or grade three, the, there is obvious weakness of the facial muscles, and that is evident when when you ask the patient to. Uh, hold air inside the mouth. The patient won't be able to hold the air inside the mouth because of the weakness of the orbicularis oris. So there is weakness, muscular weakness, but it is not so disfiguring. These patients may not be able to lift the eyebrow. These patients may not be able to lift the eyebrow and complete eye closure and uh, is not here. The patient is, has partial eye closure and they will uh, they be able to close eye with maximal effect on it, maximal effort rather. They will have to uh, use maximal effort to keep the eye closed. But uh, there is no disfiguring synchronisis. In grade 4, there is moderately severe uh, dysfunction. There is obvious weakness, disfiguring weakness rather. The patient is not able to lift up the eyebrow. There is incomplete eye closure and there is Synchinesis, severe synchinesis, mass movement, and when the patient is uh, attempting to close the eye, there will be a deviation of the angle of the mouth. Then in grade 5, there is severe dysfunction, motion barely perceptible, there is total paralysis, eye closure is incomplete, there is slight movement of the corner of the mouth. Bell's phenomenon is evident in this patient. In total paralysis, there is no movement at all, there is total loss of muscle tone, synchinesis, and uh, contracture or pain is also seen in these patients.
management involves classically investigations and treatment. So, investigations. First thing is, while you investigate a patient, you need to investigate the pro to find out the probable level of the patient nomination. Where exactly the patient now is involved or affected. So, the test which helps us to identify the probable area of involvement of patient now is known as topognostic test. So let us see the topognostic, topognostic test that helps to identify the location of the nerve injury. The first topognostic test which we commonly do is the Schrimmer's test. This test helps us to test the integrity of the greater superficial petrosal branch of the patient. So how will you ever exactly perform this test? So you use strips of filter paper. This filter paper's uh, width is around uh, 2 by 3 millimeters, 2.5 to 3 millimeters, and then the length is around 10 millimeters. It is kept at the inferior conjunctival fornix. You keep these filter papers into a hook to the lower conjunctival fornix. You keep it for 5 minutes and you can measure the length of the paper that will be moistened and you compare it with the other eye. Supposing if there is 75% unilateral decrease in the lateral emission. It indicates that there is long deficient lateral emission in that eye, and then if there is a bilateral decrease, see bilateral decrease can be ascertained if the lateral emission is less than 10 millimeters, wetted for both sides at five minutes. So if there is less than 10 millimeter wetting on both sides, it shows that there is a bilateral decrease in lateral emission. So your Schirmer's test tells us not only whether lateral emission is affected one side. In that case, there will be 75% less uh, wetness than compared to the normal light. And when there is a total of uh, less than 10 millimeters wetting on both sides, it goes without saying there is lack of deficient lack of emission in both sides. Then next comes the stepidate reflex. The stepidate reflex tests the integrity of the nerve to stepidates. This can be easily tested by impedance audiometry. Uh, you can assess whether the nerve to stepidase is uh, acting in has integrity or not, has connectivity or not. And then electrogastrometry tests the sensation of taste in the anterior two third of the tongue. And this is uh, a test to uh, uh, test for the integrity of the coronary parenchyma. Then you can test for salivary flow. This can be again done by candulating the Wharton stuff. And reduction in 25% is considered to be abnormal. You just candidate the water and stuff, then you measure the salivary flow over the time. You use a gastric stimulus like keeping a small chocolate under the tongue. The reduction of 25% is considered to be abnormal. The salivary flow test and the electrogastrometry test for the integrity of the quarter tympanic nerve. So, if the Schirmer's test is uh, negative, what it indicates? It indicates the lesion is at the level of the geniculate ganglion. It is at the level of the geniculate ganglion or it, in, it is in fact a level above the geniculate ganglion. If the, if the damage is at the level of the geniculate ganglion or higher than the level of the geniculate ganglion, the Schirmer's test will be negative. The stapedial reflex again, if the lesion is occurs somewhere between the geniculate ganglion and the second genu of the patient now, safety and reflected is absent. And then electrogastrometry again, for a tympanic now is given off from the tympanic segment of the patient now. So if the electrogastrometry proves that the taste is uh, normal, then the lesion can be uh, uh, the lesion can could have occurred at a level below the level of the exit of the carotid parenchyma. And then salivary flow testing, it tells us again the integrity of the carotid parenchyma. So if the salivary flow is normal, it shows that the level of the lesion is below that of the level where the carotid parenchyma has generated from the patient. So this approximately tells us the probable location of damage of the patient. 
Now let us go to the diagnostic test. The diagnostic test can be imaging both CT and MRI. Both CT and MRI are very important diagnostic tests. Then you can perform electroneuronography and electromyography. And these two tests are very important to decide the prognosis of the lesion as well as to decide whether active intervention is needed or not. Then cutonodometry is done to rule out media pathology. And then transcranial magnetic stimulation is performed to test for the integrity of the cranial component of the facial nerve. Cranial component of the facial integrity of the cranial component of the facial nerve can be assessed by transcranial magnetic stimulation. Now coming to the treatment, it depends on the cause. The main problem is you should treat the complications caused by the facial nerve paralysis. First thing is the ideal way to treat complications is to prevent the complication from arising in the first place. So most common dreaded complication of facial nerve paralysis is the exposure directly. That is because of the inability of the patient to close the eye. So this can be prevented, the damage to the eye can be prevented by uh, protecting the eye, giving the patient protective goggles with side protection so that the cornea will be protected or you can use an eye cap to close that eye and then on a long term basis you can use weighted objects to hold the uh, upper lip down inferiorly. So you can use uh, platinum weight, you can use gold weight so that it, you can hold the lid down so that the eye close the lower uh, lid will compensate and close the eye lid totally. Then physiotherapy can be advised to prevent uh, muscular wasting and then facial nerve decompression can be carried out or facial nerve anastomosis can be carried out depending on the electrophysiological findings. So what do you mean by electrophysiological findings? If the electromyography shows uh, no action potential, it goes without saying the recovery is going to be really very poor. So you need to uh, go ahead and uh, do a surgical repair. If the electroneuronography is silent, if the electroneuronography is silent, that is notorious, that is really notorious because it indicates no stimulus is passing and there is going to be further damage uh, to the musculature, volume of the muscle. So these patients should undergo immediate decompression or the facial nerve anastomosis. And in the case of uh, long-standing facial nerve anastomosis, uh, facial nerve paralysis, these de facial nerve decompression or facial nerve uh, anastomosis is not possible, it won't give the desired result. You can resort to facial reanimation techniques where you use uh, muscle sling in appropriate areas to ensure that portion of the face uh, musculature will be compensated by these muscular slings. And here the plastic surgeon's role is really vital. Thank you. Thank you.